Thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks for giving us an opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, what our program is about and uh, some of the questions we are asking and uh, discussing. Uh, it's, it's very nice to see people from another program, and uh, I was there for the Casmir effect, is that right? Yes. And so this is neurophysics of locomotion. So that's our program. And in the title I give, I happen to choose something slightly philosophical, which is a, bi a mo body mind problem in neurophysics of locomotion. I will try to explain what I mean by this. And, but before I do that, let me just give you a brief uh, overview of uh, our program. Um, we are, so why are we here? Who, who are we? Um, we are a bunch of, uh, let's see, a mixture of physicists. So there's a physics plus neuro, naturally. And as well as uh, engineering people and the biomechanics. And I might also add as people, some people may come from computer science. So as you can see, it's a, a good mixture and lots of, a, a, actually a, a big portion of participants are from neuroscience. And the reason we uh, converge here is that somehow the new, uh, we are all interested in animal behavior. And I'll explain uh, some of the a a organism that we study. Um, now, when you study animal behavior, it's a little bit different from a uh, non-living physical system. And if you start from the neuro side, you ask questions, how do they sense the world and how do they respond? And you pro probe various of neurons internally and try to make sense of the neural algorithms. And a little by little, you realize that in order to explain the neural algorithms, say so you might say, I start with neural algorithms, and you realize you really actually need physics. One part is the physics of the environment where they interact with, and the other is the physical laws governing the sensory propagation and such. So we, so if you start this end, you realize you actually need physics. And likewise, for people like myself, I'm a physicist, and I actually start from the physics end, physics of flight, and uh, trying to understand, say, how dragonfly flies, how fruit fly, fly flies, and um, uh, how nature evolves them. Uh, we start from physics and physics of flight. These are the places where we can write down equations, analyze them. But also, eventually, after a few years, you realize you also need neuroscience. Meaning that the neurofeedback circuitries that evolve over the course of evolution have to be a part of explaining their behavior. So this is really why we are here and that these two uh, things uh, cannot really be separate when we think about and uh, when we try to explain animal behavior. Okay, so that's that neurophysics part. And then the locomotion part comes into play. So when, when I say animal behavior, of course it's very rich. And in particular, we are focusing on animal locomotion. Walk, run, swim. Uh, fly, crawl, jump. So these are all uh, locomotion. And so why locomotion? The reason for locomotion is it's actually a very nice set of a well-defined behavior that we can get handle on in terms of understanding. So uh, locomotion, so let me give a few examples. Walk. Run, 
fly, let's say. Right? So we do that too. Animals uh, certainly evolve uh, to do many of the functions rely, relying on their locomotion skills. And that they are among all the behavior you can think of. For example, thinking. That's another human behavior, animal behavior, quote unquote. These are experimentally quantifiable. And uh, also, it's possible to build physical models, I'll explain. Both physical and conceptual models. to understand them. So that's one reason. Another reason is that, which you might already uh, have seen, that there's so much progress in neuroscience, great uh, uh, leap of uh, a, a, a advancements in uh, genetics tools, uh, imaging tools, so there are lots and lots of data. You can have connectome now for fly, for uh, C. elegans, uh, model organisms. So we are living in an age of data. I would say exponential data. And it's really um, uh, 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 both exciting and challenging. That is, how do we make sense of them? And so if you think about animal behavior, starting from, let's say, human, we have roughly 10 to 11 neurons. And if you start from that end, you can imagine it might take us a while to really get to the uh, uh, some of the fundamental questions about what governs animal behavior. And uh, the locomotion lies in a downstream end. So let's say you have lots and lots of these neurons. They lie in our head, in our ventral cord. And what they do in terms of producing locomotion is fairly downstream. So they go through a bunch of processes. And eventually, they all put some motor program, which is far simpler compared to what you start with. And what they then do is they control the limbs. So it could be a wing, or could it be a leg or arm? Poor drawing, but you get the point. And these things live in the physical world. I mean, they also live in the physical world. This is the external physical world. That really, I don't know how to spell world. That's bad. OK. Well, let's see. WD. It just escapes me O and uh, O and L. It doesn't matter. Um, so the point is that it's very complex here too. If you uh, ever try to model a swimming, swimming or flying, extremely complex. Um, you have equations. For example, if you think about flight, you already have to deal with Navier-Stokes equations. You have to deal with, say, a uh, rigid body, uh, say, newton euler equation. And then you have all kinds of biomechanics comes into play at the muscle level and whatnot. OK, it's very complex. But nevertheless, if you think about the a number of degrees, it's far less than what you start with, which is billions. OK, so the way um, there, there, there are various approaches. So neuroscience can tease out 
many, many middle blocks. You focus on these middle uh, part or the beginning part, say visual. Uh, there's tremendous, uh, probably one of the most successful and dominant uh, research direction in neuroscience traditionally has been in the vision, and plus at the older reception and so on. And uh, people are now starting into the middle layer and so on and so forth. But um, the point here is animal locomotion is something you observe here, that they have to move in the space of, in physics, uh, uh, move in the space of 3D space, the physical world, and uh, they are describable by governing equations, governing physical laws that we know of. And this is our connection or the interface to neuroscience. And if you're a neuroscientist, you kind of look in this way. And if you happen to think about sensory, what's called a sensory motor circuit. Circuit. I don't spell very much anymore. Circuits. You look at this end, and you realize there are two interfaces with the world. And perhaps initially, how do you sense the world? Right? So this is a sensory end. I'm simplifying here. Sensory inputs. That's also physical, or at least the kind of physical world we uh, can uh, see and feel. Um, uh, but also, as, as I said, it's going through this whole complex, yet to be teased out uh, uh, algorithm, nevertheless drives the limb movements or wing movements, and, uh, where, which obeys the physical laws. Okay, so these are the two immediate interface with the kind of a classical or macroscopic physical world that uh, physics teach. Okay, so this is a quick explanation why physicists want to talk to neuroscientists and neuroscientists want to talk to physicists. Any questions so far? Okay, so let me just quickly describe by uh, 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 some of the model organisms that we have been discussing in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, we're here for five weeks, so this is a week four, a uh, week three. Uh, Every morning we have two talks, and every talk is well attended. Everybody's still awake today, so uh, it, it's been going uh, well. And the blackboard is well used here. So if you, everybody turns around, you can see the blackboard back there. And everybody uh, is putting down their organism on that blackboard with scales and such. So I just pick a few. Okay. So um, we st let's start with uh, the small, uh, well, the fewer neuron, C. elegans. It's a round worm, C. elegans. So it's a worm that crawls. And it's about a millimeter or so, so fairly small. But the amazing thing, or the wonderful thing, is that it only has 300 neurons. So this, this was created as a model organism in the 80s uh, by Sidney Brenner, or at least. Um, he and his uh, collaborators figure this might be a great way to study the neural control of movement. And another, everybody knows about fly, genetic organism is fly. So as you know, most genetics are done now on flies. And uh, you can order any flies pretty much, or any flies with all kinds of possible genetic mutations and so on. So they have about 100,000 or 200,000 neurons in the brain and uh, multiply two probably to include ventral cord. And going to the fish side, a model organism is zebrafish. So I didn't say how big the, uh, this is. So fly is one of the actually most diverse insects on Earth. And the size really varies. But the model organism is fruit fly. It's very small. The soldier fly is much bigger. Or robber fly is a bit bigger. So fruit fly, if we drosophila, 
is about similar size, actually, a couple more. So I'll put three millimeter for now, okay? Again, small organism. And zebrafish also varies uh, from lava to uh, adult. And uh, the, uh, uh, the number of neurons happens to be similar to fly. Um, and then we have us, human. We are bipedal. Has much, much more neurons. Okay, so in terms of locomotion, this has an undulatory form, so it mostly crawl can go forward and then backward. Fly does many amazing things. Hover, for ascend, forward, backward, tumble, recover, reflex. Zebra fish, more or less buoyant, and uh, also can do forward, backward, and turn, and yaw. Uh, human, uh, we do even more things. Um, walk, run, jump, tumble. What else can we do? Um, oh, just look at gymnasts and uh, acrobats. Um, okay, so these are the organisms we can, uh, 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 people study for a variety of reasons. And uh, as I said before, uh, now the genetic tools, and if we have connectome for this. In other words, the anatomy, the neuroanatomy of this is known for the C. elegans, completely known. And that was probably the first uh, mapped out. Uh, a connectome a, uh, model organisms, and a fruit fly, the head at least is known. So this is also known to a larger degree. And the zebra fish, I think people who here can help me, uh, whether it's no, I mean, people are imaging this. And uh, um, so th the idea is we now have a dictionary, so to speak, of connectivity, right? So these are neuroanatomy. They, what they tell us is neuroanatomy. And people also have tools for, uh, I would call it neurogenetics, meaning that you can actually specifically target specific neurons and make them do things. So optogenetics is a big tool. Optogenetics. So if you see a fish with green light or uh, that's, or, or uh, see elegans with a green light, they're usually tagged and when the light, and the, uh, when the light shines on them, um, they also respond. So uh, I guess the tool is such that you have this complex neural circuitry and uh, these uh, genetics tools allows you to say, turn this on and turn that off. So they have uh, already control for uh, any subset of the circuitry. This is great. And then you see, well, how does that affect the behavior? Behavior in this case, let's say locomotion, how they crawl, how they do they go. A certain circuitry is critical for forward movement versus backward movement. It sounds, well, this part is exciting and uh, uh, great, but nevertheless, there's lots of things are entangled. So it's not just simply a, when you turn off a, a neuron, if it does something, you can conclude, say, well, this neuron actually leads to this. So it's hard to establish causal uh, effect. So uh, it's, as I learned from the last, in the last three weeks from these talks, is that one try to make progress by isolate a subset of neurons and a build action or people trying to build action diagrams. Essentially says, well, if A is on, it leads to B, and the B might suppress C, and the C might do something to D, and altogether this might lead to a forward movement. Okay. And these action diagrams is a conceptualization based on the experiments 
but um, it's still usually these uh, individual circuits might be coupled to many other things that you are yet able to monitor. So within that realm, there's uh, plenty to, to uh, work on just to figure those out. Yes. Oh, probably not. Uh, usually, that's another thing. Uh, I mean, there's uh, lots of uh, things that are preserved, but uh, you, what, I mean, it's not 100% identical, I wouldn't think. Yeah. But in the worm, they are, right? In the worm, apparently they are. Uh, so there are worm people here who can actually say, say this, but uh, maybe not identical, not in the sense of two solids have the same atoms arranged in perfect order, crystal, even... Even in the real material, they're never identical either. Yes. Any other? And it, it will be very disappointing if they are all identical. Then, yeah, we might all be the same. Yes. So more basic question for my folks. Yes. Uh, um, how does the fraction of total neurons that are the photo neurons change with the total size? Yes. So I don't have that quite, uh, answer. I was trying to figure. Uh, I was trying to answer the same question. So I would say a uh, smaller fraction. So maybe the people here again, the neuroscientists. Can you, might Matthew, say something about this? Answer his question about your lava. Yeah, because lava, the the lava is not the adult stage where they can fly. It's the stage where they grow. The brain and the neurons are the So they, in the adults, would you say it's, it might be the other way around? I think it's about the same. I don't know the ratio there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you... You see? They don't... They, they're still arguing. Okay. But these are very good questions. In other words, that already itself, in terms of understanding the organization of neurons, how much do you need? Why do you need that so much? These are all questions that might hopefully be answered eventually. Uh, but people are just start to kind of, my sense is, kind of just picking away few parts and uh, uh, answers like a, for a more gen generality of the design will come later. And that's part of why we're here by bringing physics is trying to raise uh, general questions. And so the question uh, one can ask is what are they for, right? What are they for? And this is critical. If you just look at anatomy, it's not enough. If you just look at anatomy, you can guess what they're for. But this is where behavior comes in. That's why I keep emphasizing, oh, maybe, yeah, animal behavior. So they are evolved to perform certain function, right? So people will say, well, function leads form. So if you try to understand form, this arrangement of these various neurons, you, well, it, might, it helps to understand what they actually designed for. So behavior, function, those are the words you'll hear. And, and so in order to understand the uh, organization of ultimately all these connectome, how they organize, why this thing is turned on, the other thing is turned on, you can imagine an idealized experiment. You put this animal into all possible behavior, and then you have this what's called a behavioral assay, and then you look at the neural firing patterns and uh, trying to uh, construct possibly a map between the two. But that's extremely complex, as you can see. Okay, it's like monitoring every air molecules here and trying to say what happens to the wind over there or something. Okay, big problem. Uh, so it's just the sheer number of things, right? So this is a number is large. That makes it complex. And another thing which is very important, which is very different from physical system, this is for the physicists in the audience, makes it complex 
is there's a loop. Okay. So all of this make it complex. And this loop is, has to do with actually the title of my talk, which is mind-body or body-mind problem. That is, when we think about physics, physics governs the body, celestial body. We're trying to figure out the movement of planets. We figure out the physical law. And it doesn't react, the planet doesn't, well, the way one planet reacts on the other is the same way as the other planet acts on this. Okay, same law. But when we think about animal behavior, there's something else going on, which is these neural algorithms. So, so this is kind of quote unquote mind, right? Body and mind. And these are neural algorithms. So the fundamental difference between the two is this is physical, governed by physical laws. And I think I realized this actually not too long ago. One is law, the other is algorithm. What does that mean? Uh, it means the laws actually doesn't change through the course of evolution. The algorithm does. It's an extremely important point I like to emphasize a lot. So understanding your algorithm needs also to look at the evolutionary context. And the first thing for understanding the evolution of an algorithm is actually physics itself, because as soon as you evolve living systems, physics, physical laws are already around. Okay, so these are the two things I want to emphasize. One is law, the other is algorithm. But moreover, the complexity comes in from this loop that is body, the mind constantly sends the body, and then instructs the body, and so it creates the, what's called a feedback loop. And that's very different from non-living system. It doesn't create its own self-feedback system. And whenever we do Feynman diagrams, there's a self-loop, oh, things goes wrong. But anyhow, that, uh, uh, but for, when you think about animal system, a, feed loop, a feedback loop is everywhere. So this makes it unique, I think, to animals and to living things, to living systems. OK. All right, so what do we do? Uh, we have a complex living system. And uh, how do we make progress on this? So one way to do it is you kind of break this periodically and see what happens and then reconnect. So lots of um, deconstruction, taking things apart essentially. And then you kind of piece them together, put back together. And that put together, back together, is often through models. So if there's another key word I like to emphasize is the importance of model building. Otherwise, you just replicate what you see in nature, and uh, we don't go very far. So we must conceptualize them. And whether you build models on computer or through physical means as a moving system, uh, we must have models. So I already think I covered all my key points. That is, to study animal locomotion, we need physics plus neuroscience. The system is complex for lots of reasons. Uh, in addition to being having too many degrees of freedom, too many control variables, too many unknowns, uh, there's another complexity, which is the definition of a living system is something that acts onto itself. Okay, I think I can't say that. I didn't, I didn't invent this. Uh, in addition to uh, just being reprodu uh, reproducing. Anybody's taking a picture of this because I'm not sure. I can remember everything I said. I'm just talking, you see. I don't have anything prepared. Okay. All right, I should raise some. Uh, any other questions uh, uh, before I raise the bottom board? 
and I'll give you something specific, which come from the stuff that we've been working on, which is flight. Um, um, trying to untangle some of these things in the case of thinking about how nature evolves the flight, okay, in, in the case of insect flight. Arrays, okay. So evolution of flight, um, human invented flight, or at least the working flight, um, which is airplanes in the 1900s. But uh, the flight, animal flight, came uh, about much earlier. And the, one, the first animal group that invented flight are insects. And uh, that was about 350 million years ago. And the subsequent word, uh, was Tesseros, uh, bats, birds, birds, bats. Um, the, one of the oldest insects are in the what called the ancient origin order. They're dragonflies, and damselfly, and also mayfly. And I just see, uh, actually, there are a couple of dragonflies flying outside the KITP. I don't know if people realize, uh, see them. So there are four wing insects. So if you see a four wing insect, independently controlled by a group of local muscles. So that's the ancient form. Which, which, one thing I'm still um, kind of amazed by is he is one of the earliest involved insects, and it's still one of the most maneuverable and most efficient. So somehow they already managed to find an extremely, uh, I would say, efficient and a nearly optimal solution to fly back then, and yet, and, and they continue to survive. And the other insect which I talked about earlier is Diptera, or fly. They have very different form. Only two wings, and the hind wings become a pair of sensory organs called haltiers. So they beat like wings, but now they no longer function as an aerodynamic force generator, but instead sensory organ. So you can already ask an interesting question that is why and how and all that. And there are many other forms, of course, that they're the garden variety ones, which are um, bees and uh, butterflies, um, and which we're familiar with. They all have different forms. And in itself, if you just look at, go to a museum, you look at this collection of insects they have, you can immediately draw a few conclusions. One is the form is very diverse. So there's really a diverse solution to flight. Unlike our airplanes, it's always going forward. That itself is an interesting optimization question nature does. And of course, this has to be interpreted in the context of evolution, which is somehow mutation plus adaptation. leads to this diversity. But there's also something very much in common that is, doesn't matter it has two wings or four wings, roughly speaking, they have a body plus wings, right? So body plus wings. And they fly, therefore they have air, they need air. And that's the essential ingredients. And one more thing one might add is gravity. And that more or less explains 
the physical system of this. Exactly how the waves are actuated, that's biomechanics. But if you just look from outside, from mechanics point of view, these are the essential ingredients. So how do something learn to fly? So we do know that gravity is important. And an animal knows up and down. So if it doesn't do anything, they will always fall. But sometimes they actually fall very beautifully. So the way a dragonfly can fall is actually it can glide. So a wing, let's say a wing, this is its wing, it has four, four, four of them. Essentially, it can glide gently in air. And if there's some upwing, it makes it go up a little bit. So uh, gliding, so if it doesn't flap wing, it's gliding. And one of the most uh, amazing thing is that some of the plants, compare plants, have evolved their shapes plant leaf, uh, the seed, the seed of plants, maple seed, for example, they've evolved certain shapes that allow them to have certain gliding property. For example, efficient gliders, efficient gliders, and as well as stable gliders. And one of the movie I showed before is you have this amazing big seed, which, which is a big, it's, it, it, it's like um, a little half, uh, half disc, but carry another half disc in the middle, and it can glide for a kilometer, which is quite extraordinary. So passive gliders is, does exist in nature, but very, very few. Most of the gliders uh, doesn't have such a property. OK, so that's step one. So if you just have gravity and do nothing, you can travel. But eventually you'll fall. That's, there's no way around it, it's just from energy consider, uh, consideration. So you must do something if you don't want to fall. So fly is not to fall. So you have to come up with strategies not to fall. So what would you do? Well, you must move your wing, right? Flap wing. Uh, you say, what happens to the airplane? It doesn't flap its wing, it's still going. That's because it has a jet. Okay. And the airplane wing only is a lifting surface. You need to burn fuel to create a jet so that it travels forward. And we can get to that if you have a question. But for now, let's consider flapping. Flap wings. Okay, that immediately raises lots of interesting questions. How do you flap wings? You, should I flap? So it's a reciprocal motion. The wings, if you look up on the side, it moves sort of forward or backward to the leading order. But the angle of attack or the orientation of the wing must change. If you just do this, it's not very efficient. So you actually, so that one thing you can already imagine, you slice forward like so, and then you reverse the pitch, go back. So at least you create a symmetric uh, stroke. And in fact, lots of insects do that. So these are reciprocal motion. But also another thing which is important is if you do this simple reciprocal motion at zero Reynolds number, you also know going anywhere. I don't know if people heard about this. So reciprocal motion at zero Reynolds number generates no thrust. And because at zero Reynolds number, there is a time reversal symmetry. OK, so there's no inertia. The fluid experience such, uh, has such a, uh, uh, this, uh, this, it's so viscous, anything you do to it immediately dissipates. All the momentum gets dissipated. It really turns into a geometrical kinematic problem. At every instance, you are equilibrium. So if you just do that, and you look at the configuration of your wing stroke, and if you're moving in this one-dimensional space, you can immediately prove that you will not go. It will not go anywhere. So they do reciprocal motion, but also at a Reynolds number that's not zero. Okay, so inertia, fluid inertia has to be important. 
breaks the time reversibility. So fluid inertia is at play to break time reversibility. And for most uh, uh, insects, Reynolds number is typically greater than 10. And I know there's the smallest insects supposedly around uh, between 1 and 10, but for now I'll say it at 10. Okay. So if we go back to our earlier picture, we saw a fly and we saw a dragonfly. So a fly works at Reynolds number about 100. Dragonfly, Reynolds number about 3 solid. Okay, it's a little higher, a little bigger, which makes sense. And if you look across different insects, they might go from 10 to uh, maybe the up, up end of a few salads, say hawk moths and uh, uh, even larger bugs. Okay, so that is flapping wing is ultimately coupled to aerodynamics. Um, this is an uh, enormously complex subject by itself, and I don't have enough time to get into it, but if you're interested, we can discuss. In other words, when the wings actually flap back and forth, the flow is complex and looking slightly turbulent, even though turbulence is not the right word. It's not called unsteady aerodynamics. And the force created or generated by this flapping wing is different from the force uh, you expect a uh, translating wing, steadily translating wing on airfoil. So this is a big topic in uh, unsteady aerodynamics. And uh, uh, people and us, we uh, compute these things and uh, trying to understand what's actually really going on. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, essentially, that, so I'll just say, what's the key part? The key part is actually happening at the two edges when this thing is moving, okay? This is called a trailing edge and a leading edge. Vortices being created there, and they will be shared, they will interact, and so on. So lots of the cool things one can learn by play with those vortices. Okay, so that's aerodynamics. And suppose you now, you can pose it already, uh, a question, which motion? We know the governing equation, and in principle we can uh, pose an optimization problem that is, I give you a wing and a weight. Your job is to move the wing such that it can balance the weight with least amount of effort. And when we get wing motions look like what bugs do, uh, for example, if you put the right parameters for fly versus dragonfly, well, they actually move the wings like one might calculate on computer. And we did this exercise a few years back, and they realized that there's one feature that such a optimization can capture is precisely that at the end of the wing stroke, they should reverse rather than do something else, and which actually capture some of the wing and awake interaction. And this explains um, actually how the, uh, the, why the wings evolve into certain shape. In this case, let's say if most wings, if you look at dragonfly wing, there's often a strong leading edge, and the way they rotate is forward of this wing, not in the center. And that explains uh, this is a possible way to actually create a more efficient wing motion. Okay, so that's that. And uh, then... That's not, not enough, okay? So the point is, if you generate enough forces, that's still not enough. And this is where eventually neuroscience comes in. So far, it's all physics. The reason it's not enough is it's actually very unstable. So you need neural circuit, feedback circuitries to stabilize themselves as well as maneuver in air. So that's another aspect of not fall, not falling. So the, essential, the general problem is the following. So I have a fly. Now I can make them generate enough forces to balance 
gravity. But if you perturb this position a little bit, it actually is unstable. So this is very similar to the human standing. So if I stand like so, my stand of mass is above the ground. If I tilt, I'll fall. I mean, without neurofeedback circuitry. So fly has the same problem uh, when they stand in air. And so the way you understand the stability is you uh, can now calculate the stability property of this, of the bug. And mathematically, it boils down to understand, first of all, how they evolve in the dynamical space. And so if I imagine I'm just tra traveling in the longitudinal plane, I can only go up forward because I'm flapping uh, my wings symmetrically left and the right. I have some phase space, and the phase space is characterized by four dynamical variables. I'm just going to group them here, U, V, and the body orientation theta, and a theta dot. So you can imagine that in this four-dimensional space, there's lots of dynamical trajectories for each flight. And if you choose your initial condition properly and uh, with the proper wing motion, you can find that there are actually periodic orbits. And uh, these are the periodic orbits that one can analyze the stability, meaning that if I deviate a little bit, I might end up in some new place. And this displacement with respect to the initial condition forms the Jacobian, and of which the eigenvalues of which gives us the stability property. So for two winged insects, It's actually very generic. The generic property is that most of these states are unstable unless it falls. Okay, so stable unless falling fast. So that's another interesting thing. If you think about uh, explaining the um, evolution of flight, because it doesn't matter, um, so we, we, I said there are millions of the different species, or at least a five, ten million species, and uh, it, interesting question to ask, what, what percentage or what portion of them are actually evolved toward this um, unstable, uh, unstable uh, fronts? And uh, I suspect a lot for almost all flying insects. Some are walking flightless, and that's a different story. Okay, so this, is, this part is still uh, physics, meaning that now we can analyze, build a model and I analyze these flights, and we find out that actually most of them are unstable. So now we need controllers. So how do the insects control their flight? Well, they have many, many different ways and different feedback loops. Vision is involved and a mechanical sensor is involved. And uh, the way, uh, the one I'm going to talk about uh, primarily focuses on local mechanical sensors. Uh, but even so, uh, you should bear in mind that uh, in general, when you see uh, an insect in nature, they use multimodal uh, feedback control. Dragonfly, okay, that's a very good question. We thought dragonfly might be stable, so we actually calculate those two because it has four wings, that makes sense. Who asked that question so I can talk? You, yeah, so, so you have four wings, it looks more stable. And we did that calculation, at least for the morphological parameters we put in, still unstable. And then we actually tried to change the hinge position 
For example, the only way you can make it stable, you actually have to separate the four and the high and the wind pair, which makes sense from a mechanics point of view. But you have to separate pretty far apart compared to what you see in the actual uh, morphology. Yes? When you go from two winds to four winds, is the number of unstable directions increasing? The other way around. Four to two. Four is more stable. Or the eigenlayer, in this case, both are unstable for these two uh, particular insects but uh, dragonfly is slightly more stable. Any other questions? Ah, very good. So there's a recent paper we just wrote um, with a life restaurants group. So you put the set, uh, set of mass forward. That itself is still not clear because you, when you, if you, if you try airplane, uh, paper airplane, it's hardly ever stable. So it's a real art to make them stable. And you can look up the record and that somebody can throw an airplane from this end across the whole stadium. So they have to tweak this and that. And there's a whole art to it. But so it was very surprising that um, when you actually, by change this uh, uh, shift to the center of mass forward somewhat, and if you allow them, this is done in a water tank, and if you allow them to kind of modulate themselves while they glide forward, they, we find a family of stable solution, which was entirely surprising because we didn't expect that. And if you look at the aerodynamic store calculation as a function of this, it's mutually stable, but it turned out to be stable. So the paper is in JFM this year. Okay, so stability. So that's more closely related to plants. So I'll just quickly conclude. Uh, I have five, seven minutes or so, right? Quickly conclude that in the case of diptera or flies, uh, let me get back to this hot tear. And the hot tear is beating like the wing. Okay, so I didn't tell you how fast they beat. It's about 250 hertz, and so this is the same. Also 250 hertz, beating back and forth. So what it does is it has this sensory gyroscopic so it beats back and forth on the plane of our plane which is not quite orthogonal but nevertheless the only simple message for now is that here it's attached to a rotating body so this is a Foucault pendulum so if it's a Foucault pendulum then it will experience actually lots of forces among them, not inertial forces, one of them is uh, Coriolis force. So this is the velocity of the wing, and this is the rotation of the body. So somehow, they have mechanical sensors at the base, And they can detect, in principle, what this body rotation is. And moreover, and they might also detect, either through integration or whatnot, uh, the body orientation. So this is called hot tear. Any questions? Yeah. And what it does is tells the body, well, I'm rotating at such such rate. So one stabili uh, st stabilization algorithm of feedback control one can write down is that I must adjust my wing such that to correct for these deviations. So the way you can adjust this, you can actually adjust the center of the stroke, which is proportional to this theta, which you just observed, and also theta dot at some time earlier, because sensors require time. And you may not have to sense continuously, so you might have, you can sense at some discrete time, I would call it n. Okay, so that's the uh, uh, proportional co uh, feedback control uh, with time delay that we construct on computer trying to stabilize themselves. And it turns out you can stabilize themselves with proper uh, 
parameters, okay? And one of the prediction from this simulation is that it's good for them to sense, sense every wing beat. And moreover, there is some special muscles that attach to this wing hinge here. There are a group of them, 12 of them. Um, one of them, uh, which we call it a steering muscle, has the following firing property, which is a tonic muscle. So it's a tonic firing muscle. So if you look at the uh, new recordings of this uh, in the literature, they fire tonically. And we think that this particular muscle is engaged in controlling the pitch stability that the, bu the bugs must develop. So that's our connection to neuroscience. We didn't know this before. Um, when we were looking at these pictures, they didn't mean very much to us, meaning that they're a bunch of firing patterns, until we actually did this calculation and really looked for them and realized this particular muscle has a firing pattern that we needed for uh, control of the stability. So um, that is probably a good place for me to pause. Yes, doesn't have a sensor. So that's an uh, interesting question. So they are a little bit more stable. They are must, mostly visually guided. So another experiment I didn't talk about, but I did talk here is online. And if you look, uh, when, when we, what we did, it was, we have them falling upside down. And they can write themselves, even without the sensory feedback. What they do is they, we think they rely on vision. So they have a huge... Yeah, visual inputs. And a plus, the time scale for the wing beats are much slower, 40 hertz. So vision is sufficient. Here is too fast for vision to play a role. So that's a, another reason they evolved these uh, mechanical sensors. Yes? Is vision-wide of same time scale as the wing beats? The stability is? Like, why do you need a time scale as the wing beats? Oh, it does actually, that's an interesting question, meaning that if you actually calculate the stability, the body, the stability for the body is about 10 wing beats. So why do we need this? It's purely for control purpose. So in other words, if you, um, there's a control diagram uh, that uh, I showed often, which you can actually compute what is the parameters that you need uh, to fall between this uh, uh, to, to, to have this well-controlled uh, condition. And it shows up happen to be about three wind beats. So you don't wait until 10 wind beats because, uh, uh, for something to go to uh, exponen uh, exponentially fast. So the reason, the advantage for this really is, I think, has to do efficiency of the control. So if you just deviate a little bit, it requires almost no effort to correct itself. But if you wait a lot, and that, first of all, might go outside the linear control regime, and two, is much harder to control. So the amount of control we need here is usually a fraction of degree, uh, which is hard to tease out in experimentalists. You wouldn't necessarily see what, which part it does what. Oh, why do they like your ear? No, they're flying to the ear. Yeah, so. You think so? <laughs> I haven't. But I think you notice them when they fly into your air. <laughs> yeah, but um, I do not know. Maybe there is a behavioral, uh, the fly people can help. Uh, maybe there is something that attracts to your air in particular way, like a place to hide or something. I have no idea. I do not know. It hasn't happened to me, so I can't tell you my experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, is any does anybody why does it yeah you can post that question on our Slack chat by the way. 
Well, I'll pause it for you. Okay, okay. that's a good place to... What, oh, do you have one more? Oh, just a quick one. Yeah. Does the instability that you talked about uh, also apply to hovering place? Or just yes, hovering is unstable. Uh, the only place that's stable is falling about, in flight case, about 20, uh, 40 centimeters per second. And as more up, the, high, the faster it goes up, the more stable it is. Ascending is even more sta unstable. Yeah. Very good, well, thanks again. Okay.